and welcome to this introductory lecture on the age of Trident, historical, cultural and literary background. I'm Dr. Urvashi Sabu from PG Devi College, Delhi University, the Department of English. And I'll be guiding you through the next 30 minutes with respect to the literary, the cultural and the historical events of this particular age. Let's look at the historical background first. And some of the most important historical events of this particular period, starting with 1660, we have the restoration where King Charles II, who so far in exile in France, is restored to the throne of England, while Oliver Cromwell, who was the Lord Protector before this time, is beheaded just like he had beheaded Charles I about 10, 12 years ago. The next most important event of this age is in 1678, which is an alleged plot called the Popish Plot. And in this plot, it was believed, this was a widely spread rumor where it was believed that the Jesuits were planning to assassinate King Charles II in order to bring his Roman Catholic brother, the Duke of York, to the throne. And interestingly, Dryden's very famous poem, Absalom and Achitophel, is based on this plot. The third significant event of the age of Dryden is in 1688. It's an event called the Glorious Revolution, where William of Orange ascends the throne after King James II. If we look at the socio-cultural characteristics of this age, what were the significant developments in the cultural life of the late 17th and the early 18th century? The first thing that springs to mind is that the late 17th and the early 18th century was actually a reaction against the Puritanism of the Cromwellian period, the Cromwellian period being 1642 to 1660. This particular period marked the beginnings of a very flourishing middle class. In fact, the concept of a middle class came into existence at this time. And this middle class comprised merchants, businessmen, etc. The third important characteristic of this age is that courtly patronage was superseded first by parliamentary patronage and then by the growth of a vast literate reading public. One could actually now earn a living as a writer. If we take a look at the writers past in British history, we realize that most of them worked on court patronage. For example, Sidney, Spencer, Wyatt, Surrey, all of these had to depend on the patronage of the ruling uh, emperor, the ruling monarch, in order to write. And they were never just writers. They had other occupations. They were courtiers. They were noblemen. They were aristocrats. They had other occupations, but writing was never considered as an occupation. In the 18th century, this very significant change comes about that one can now actually earn a living as a writer. And because books are published, booksellers and publishers begin to thrive. The copyright laws are formed in the year 1709. The other significant cultural event of this age would be the establishment of the Royal Society of London in 1642. The society was chartered in 1662. Its earliest members included scientists Isaac Newton, architect Christopher Wren, and so on. It was a very distinguished uh, society which debated, discussed, brought about theoretical ideas on various issues relating to science and its development. One of the most significant aspects of this age, and particularly one that has been discussed by numerous writers of the 17th and the 18th century, is the city of London and the changes that take place in this city. London becomes not just the capital, of course, it is the capital of England. It not just becomes the political capital, but it's also the center of every kind of activity. It becomes a huge, sprawling, bustling, dirty, prosperous, glittering city. And writers of all kinds, of every ilk, wrote about this city. Of course, the city exhibited a very Janus-like two-faced capacity 
of being a city comprised of the super rich, the elite, the aristocrats, the people who had it best from all the colonial endeavors that were taking place all over the world with respect to England. But it also comprised of a very, very poor, scraggly, scroungy, dirty space where the absolutely poor people lived. So it had these two very segregated uh, sides. And anyone who says that the 18th century was an era of comparative peace and prosperity should actually look at the other side of the coin and see what was the ugly underbelly of London. Having said that, it still remains the center in the 18th century of literary activity, of political activity, of cultural growth, of trade, business, and in every way, the metropolis that it is today. One of the very significant and very interesting cultural qualities or cultural, let us say, developments of this particular age of the 18th century was the spread and growth of coffee houses. Now, all of us in India are familiar with the concept of coffee houses. I think people all over the world are familiar with the concept of coffee houses. We have some international chains, Barista, Cafe Coffee Day, Costa Coffee, etc., etc. And essentially, these are places where you can sit, relax, have a talk with your friends, drink a cup of coffee and spend as much time as you like. Generally, as they would say in today's terminology, chilling. Now, these coffee houses that were established during the late 17th, early 18th century in London became very active centers for meeting people. You went to a coffee house not just to drink coffee. You went to participate in debates, discussions on issues related to politics, religion, literature, science, and all other aspects of day-to-day -day life. The who's who of London, of the political world and the literary world, went to coffee houses. They had their own favorites, in fact. And it was at one such coffee house called Will's Coffee House that the young 12-year-old Alexander Pope met the aging Dryden for the first time. So coffee houses, in fact, become uh, the germination points for ideas, for debates. And these debates weren't ugly, although sometimes they did turn ugly, but the ugliness was almost always restricted to words. And one of the ways in which the debates took place I will touch upon that when I come to the literary characteristics of this particular age more in detail, was the, the publishing and the coming out of various periodicals, of journals, where all these writers who met at various coffee houses to discuss ideas came out with what you call the essay. Uh, in the religious domain, uh, this is a very interesting and a significant period because there is no violent persecution of Catholics or Protestants as such, but Catholics were deprived of benefits that were available to Protestants. We all know that the religious history of England displays a very interesting characteristic, and that is that the faith of the ruling monarch determines which other sect is going to have it good or bad in the religious domain. So if the ruling monarch is a Protestant, the Catholics are not going to have it good. If the ruling monarch is a Catholic, the Protestants are not going to have it good. Something like this was visible during the reign of King Elizabeth, uh, the period that is, that is normally called the golden age of uh, English history. Something uh, similar happens at this time, except that there is no violent persecution, but Catholics are deprived of the benefits that have been available to Protestants. So, for example, Alexander Pope, who is Dryden's slight contemporary and then continues into the 18th century, Alexander Pope was a Catholic. And because he was a Catholic, he couldn't own land in London. He couldn't study at the great universities of Oxford or Cambridge because these were run by the Anglican Church. The other development during this period is that the power of the royal court decayed and the parliament gradually becomes more powerful. And it is at this time that the two prominent political parties of Britain come into existence. The Whig party, which consisted of the parliamentarians, and the Tory, which consisted of the royalists. And this two-party system exists in Britain even today. 
today these parties are no longer called the Whigs or the Tories, they are called the Labour Party and the Conservatives. Now having done with the social and the historical uh, characteristics of this age, let us without any further ado come to the literary background of the late 17th and the early 18th century. So the period from 1660, which if you remember was when the restoration took place, the period from 1660 to 1780 spanning Dryden's maturity to the death of Dr. Johnson has been called by various names in the, in the study of literature. And these names are the Augustan age, the neoclassical age, the age of prose, the age of reason, the age of satire, the enlightenment. Now let me take these names one by one and let us try to deconstruct what these names actually mean when we are talking about the late 17th and the early 17th, the early 18th century. The Augustan age. Now from 27 BC to AD 14 in the ancient Roman Empire, Augustus Caesar was the ruler. And his period is the time which is regarded as the golden age of classical Rome. This was also the time when great writers like Virgil, Ovid, Horace, etc. flourished and wrote. Now the writers of the 18th century had great regard, great reverence, great respect for these classical writers. And the comparative peace and prosperity that prevailed during the late 17th and the 18th centuries gave or uh, lent itself to comparison with the peace and prosperity that existed during the age of uh, Augustus in ancient Rome. And that is why this particular literary period is given the adage or the name of the Augustan age. This age is also called the Neoclassical Age and one can see the connections between its, its looking back to ancient Rome which is regarded as the classical age in history. The Neoclassical Age because the writers of the 18th century believed that the ancients, the ancient classical writers had perfected every literary form that there was and that good literature could be learned or the art of good writing could be learned simply by emulating the ancients or the classical writers. Also, the writers of the 18th century sought to emulate not just the, the thematic ideas of the writers of the classical age, they also sought to emulate the literary characteristics of the classical age. And that is why the 18th century is also called the Neoclassical Age. It's also termed the Enlightenment. Enlightenment because this is the age when science comes into its truest form. And the debate between science and religion which has, pers which has persisted even today and which began during the time of Milton comes to a head at this point of time with science taking precedence over simply belief in religion. And so the age of enlightenment in a sense is the progeny of the Renaissance. And this is the time in the 18th century when people feel that the modern age has really and truly begun. So the age of enlightenment. This particular literary period 1660 to 1780 is also called the age of prose. Now if you just look back at the poets, the writers writing before the 18th century, you discover that most of them either wrote drama, which was a lot poetic, a lot more poetic, or they wrote poetry. You have epics, uh, you have sonnets, you have drama that's being written into literature. And this particular age, the 18th century, sees an efflorescence of prose. And this prose is, is, is visible in the various essays, that are written in the periodicals, in the journals that come out during this age. So the age of prose. It's also called the age of reason. Now one might wonder, were the writers before the 18th century irrational? Did they, did they not follow reason 
So in what way does the 18th century define reason? And why is it that this age is called the age of reason? Now reason in the 18th century meant over and above all common sense. Simply common sense. So this idea was given more prominence over a hankering about emotion, about passion, about internalization, about subjectivity and the stress instead was on reason as represented in common sense. One of the last names that is given to this age but the most significant name is the age of satire. Now, why would the 18th century be called the age of satire? No other literary period has ever been given a name based on a genre. You don't have an epic age or a sonnet age or a lyric age or a ballad age or a dramatic age. Why then the age of satire? Let's take a look at the historical and the cultural background that we've just discussed so far. We've discussed how London became a centre of activity. We've discussed how there is a reading public. More and more works in literature are accessible to more and more people. It's also the age of comparative peace and prosperity. It is the age that looks back to the golden period of Rome as its ideal. And this is what the writers of this particular age sought to achieve. Perfection. They sought to... They sought, they weren't merely paper messiahs. They sought to create through their literature or to enthuse in their works people to be a better people, to follow etiquette, to follow a certain manner of living. And at the same time, they spoke very extensively about the follies, the idiosyncrasies, the strange characteristics that some classes and masses of this age exhibited. So satire as a genre comes in, into its own in the 18th century. And that is why this particular age is called the age of satire. The writers of this period took upon themselves not just the literary but also the moral responsibility of trying to improve the people of this age. And what better way to do it than through satire. Uh, more about satire later. But let's come to some of the other literary characteristics of this age. Now significantly, poetry, even prose for that matter, begins to be written on public rather than private themes. Now when we define the difference or when we talk of the difference between public and private, to talk about something public in your work means to talk about man in society. Man as a social entity takes precedence in the poetry, in the literature of this age, as opposed to a precedence over emotions. Nature becomes a secondary, almost non-existent entity. And it is only discussed in poetry in connection with man. In fact, nature is looked upon, and remember, this is the age of Isaac Newton. So nature is looked upon as a vast machine that's functioning according to pre-existent laws. And man's control over nature or man's connection with nature is the only manner in which nature features in this poetry, in the, in the literature of the 18th century. Satire, of course, as I just mentioned, begins to be used as a prominent genre. In fact, entire works are written which are simply called satires. And the heroic couplet becomes the salient stanza for poetry. Now, the heroic couplet is a very, very important aspect of understanding the literature, particularly the poetry of Dryden and the poetry of this age. Every poet writing in the 18th century used the heroic couplet as a stanza form. Now please remember that the main features of the poetry of this period were harmony, decorum, balance, precision, restraint and discipline. Where are all these qualities coming from? They weren't the product of the 18th century. Once again, we will go back to the 18th century's reverence of the classical writers. 
And it is precisely these qualities in the classical writers that were idealized, that were looked upon as the epitome of perfection and taken by the writers of the 18th century. I will go back to these ideas once again with you so that you can remember them. The salient uh, features of the poetry of this period, harmony, decorum, balance, precision, restraint and discipline. And the stanza form that was best suited to express these qualities was the heroic couplet. What is the heroic couplet? As we can see, a couplet is a two-line stanza. So the heroic couplet consists of two rhymed lines in iambic pentameter. If you heard of uh, this particular form of poetry, the iamb and the pentameter, we would realize that the iambic pentameter is a line which is closest to um, everyday spoken speech. All right. So the iambic pentameter consists of 10, uh, it's a 10 uh, syllable line with one stressed and one unstressed syllable. So it goes de dum, de dum, de dum, de dum, de dum, like that. All right. So when you speak these lines, there is actually a rhythm that these lines that these, uh, these lines possess. In a heroic couplet, because the end of the couplet is rhymed, the sense of the stanza is contained within the two lines with a prolonged pause at the end of the couplet. Let me give you an example. Dryden's famous poem, McFlecknoe, which we will be discussing in a subsequent lecture, starts with, all human beings are subject to decay and when fate summons, Monarchs must obey. Two lines rhyming at the end, decay and obey. And the entire couplet contains one complete idea within it. So the couplet depicted and showed exactly the qualities that the 18th century writers prized over and above every other quality. The heroic couplet, in order to give effect, uses various stylistic devices like irony. And we all know that irony is a very important tool for satire. So it uses devices like irony, antithesis, where the first half of the couplet will speak about something, but the other half will be the exact opposite of what the first half said. It uses uh, figures of speech like zugma, where one um, verb, can stand in different relation to two nouns. Then it uses devices like circumlocution or periphrases, which is in simple words, beating about the bush, not really saying exactly what you want to say, but beating about the bush and the technical term of course for that, because you're not going to use beating about the bush in your, in a literary answer. So the technical word for that circumlocution or periphrases. The heroic couplet also uses another stylistic device called the anticlimax, where the poet begins the first line on a very high note, uh, giving rise to expectations that something very great is going to come out from the couplet. But the second line of the couplet completely destroys the high note of the previous one, thereby ending in an anticlimax. Let's take an example from Alexander Pope's very famous poem, The Rape of the Lock, and look at its opening lines. What dire offense from amorous causes springs. What mighty contests rise from trivial things. And you notice that the first line of the poem, what dire offenses from amorous causes spring, it brings you to a heightened sense of expectation. And the second line says, what mighty contests, you are still holding on to that expectation, rise from trivial things, you wonder. And then all of a sudden, the entire sense of the first line is destroyed in that last two words that the poet uses. This is a very significant device that poets use in order to bring satire, once again, into the poem. It also uses uh, devices like contradiction, paradox, etc. As we go along these lectures, when I'm doing Dryden's uh, poems with you, or when I'm doing Pope's poems with you, we will discuss more about the stylistic devices used by, the hero uh, by these writers. Uh, in the use of the heroic couplet as a stanza. This would be, in a way, a summary of the literary characteristics of this particular age. Um, 
I will be discussing the idea of satire in subsequent lectures because it requires an entire lecture on its own. Suffice it to say that satire formed a very significant part of the literature of this period and even the novels that were written during this period, let us take Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels if you've heard of that, used satire as a very important genre to convey their sense of agitation with what was going wrong with an otherwise perfect age as it was perceived to be and to try as writers to bring some sense of correctness into public behavior. With that, I'll end today's lecture. I do hope it's been, hope it's been helpful for all of you and that you will have gained something from this. I hope to see you in the subsequent lectures on the 18th century poetry of Dryden as well as of Alexander Pope. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.